This is evolution lecture number three on speciation and patterns of evolution. So speciation is formation of two new species from one species. And before we talk about what creates uh, or what causes speciation, we need to define species. So a species is a group of organisms that interbreed with one another in the same time period and produce fertile offspring under natural conditions. So it's not enough to be able to bring those organisms into a laboratory situation and get them to breed. They have to do so on their own and their offspring have to be fertile. So for example, you can mate um, horses and donkeys and get mules, but mules are sterile, which means mules cannot produce offspring. You cannot mate a mule with a mule and make more mules. So you would not consider horses and donkeys in the same species. So this is pretty easy to figure out when you've got sexually reproducing species. It's a little bit more of a challenge when you have an asexual species because you can't tell when enough mutations have built up in a population um, that would make it a totally new species because you can't check to see if they can interbreed. It also um, presents a challenge when you've got two species that you are not sure if they're members of the same species and they um, are around at vastly different times because you can't tell if they could produce fertile offspring. It can't even be tested. So anytime you have reproductive isolation, you can end up with speciation. The first type of isolation that we're gonna talk about is geographical isolation. If you keep two populations apart based on geography and they can't interbreed, uh, mutations will be random in each of those populations and you'll have different mutations. And so you will have um, eventually different traits in those populations regardless of whether the environment is, fair, is similar or not. So for example, um, here's the Colorado River and you have two species of squirrel on opposite sides. And the environment isn't dramatically different on opposite sides of um, this particular river, but the mutations that happen in those two separate populations would be random. And since they can't interbreed, they're not gonna bring alleles from one population to the other. The second type of isolation is behavioral isolation, and that is when differences in mating rituals or other reproductive strategies prevent organisms from mating. So for example, you might have um, bird songs that are unique to each species, and females will not mate with a male that sings the wrong song. Um, temporal isolation is anything having to do with time. It has sometimes also been called seasonal isolation, um, but it may be not just different seasons, but if organisms reproduce at a different time of day or a different time of year, um, they would end up not mating. So um, wood frogs and leopard frogs are closely related and live in the same range, but they mate at different times. There is definitely some overlap, but their peak mating time is different by about a month. So anytime you have isolation based on time of mating, that is temporal isolation. The next type of isolation that we're going to talk about is mechanical isolation, and that's the idea that there are physical characteristics of the organism that makes them unable to mate perhaps differences in size of reproductive organs or the size of the organisms themselves, or sometimes it's actually difference in chemical and incompatible gametes. So if we look at this Madagascar orchid, it has an 11 inch long nectar receptacle and only a specialized insect could feed and pollinate its flowers. Um, Darwin found the flower and predicted that somewhere on Madagascar there would be a moth with an 11 inch proboscis, which is a fancy science term for um, anything sticking out the front of your face. We have one, it's called our nose. Um, and he never found it, but 40 years later, someone else did. So this is the Madagascan sphinx moth and it has its proboscis fully extended. Um, and it's actually longer than its body. Another type of isolation is ecological isolation. When you have two populations and those populations are adapting to different habitats. So for example, you have an Arctic fox um, that has evolved for a cold climate and a desert fox that has evolved for a hot climate. If you look at those foxes, the Arctic fox has tiny ears 
and thick fur, and the tiny ears prevent uh, the Arctic fox from losing heat. And if you look at the desert fox, it has huge ears, and that's to help it lose heat in that very hot climate. So now I wanna talk about patterns of evolution. The first pattern of evolution I'm going to talk about is divergent evolution, and that is when two or more related species become more and more different. And it may be because those uh, populations are adapting to different environment, for example, with the Arctic fox and the desert fox. So the populations have an ancestral fox, and then they're diverging. A specific type of divergent evolution is called adaptive radiation, and that's when many species evolve from a single ancestral species due to lots of vacant niches. So for example, um, Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Island, there's lots of different finches. Um, another example would be all of the different lemur species in Madagascar. And the next pattern I want to talk about is called convergent evolution. So divergent evolution is evidence of common ancestry. Adaptive radiation is also evidence of common ancestry, but convergent evolution, in contrast, is when unrelated species appear more and more similar because those species are adapting to similar environmental conditions. So for example, if you look at the dolphin and a shark, they look alike, and actually the body shape is very similar with a modern between a modern dolphin, um, a fossil ichthyosaur, and a modern shark because they're all evolved for swimming around in water. But if you look at their ancestry, there is quite a bit of evidence to suggest that dolphins have evolved from a, a land mammal and ichthyosaurs had a land reptile as their ancestor and the modern shark had an ancient fish as its ancestor. So sharks and dolphins can look alike on the outside, but it doesn't mean they're genetically closely related. They're, those species are just evolving in an aquatic environment and end up having some of the same traits. And coevolution is when two or more species in close interaction evolve together, and each is a very important selection factor for the other. So predators and their prey might evolve together. For example, um, there is a rough-skinned newt, which is poisonous, and a garter snake, which eats that newt. And the rough-skinned newt population is evolving to be more and more toxic, and the garter snake population um, is evolving to become more and more resistant to that toxin. Parasites and their hosts evolve together, and plants and their pollinators evolve together. So for example, that orchid and that moth um, have co-evolved and um, there is a very common or really wonderful example of a hammer orchid that has evolved to mimic um, the uh, wasp and it actually attracts um, it ends up being pollinated because the parts of the flower look like a female wasp um, and there's actually a wonderful video that I am going to link to the website so that you, you guys will be able to watch the video of the hammer orchid.